tonight. Uh, with our special guest and keynote speaker, Aziza Chauni. Uh, this uh, session uh, is a Dokoma Motorki session in Maruf, and it's about uh, modern heritage at risk. Uh, Aziza is an associate professor at the University of Toronto. She also has architectural offices in Toronto in, and Fez uh, in Morocco. She has been working on the Sidi Harazam Thermal Complex for a while, and uh, today she will uh, talk to us uh, about the connections with uh, various uh, shareholders, municipalities, local administrations, and her experience in um, raising awareness about modern architecture and its uh, preservation in Morocco. She is also one of the founders of uh, Dokomoma Morocco. So welcome Azize, please the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, Nilefer, Tshakuret to all of you. It's a great honor to be here and to be uh, one of the keynotes. Um, and uh, Dokomomo is an organization that is extremely important in the preservation of the modern heritage, especially in our countries and in the Middle East where this heritage is extremely at risk today. So hello everyone from Fez uh, of Morocco. Uh, and I'm again very excited uh, to present to you work that I've been uh, that's been actually in my heart for 20 years and that I've been officially working on it for the past four. So the uh, Sidi Harazem Thermal Bath uh, is this magnificent uh, uh, brutalist complex that was built right after Morocco's uh, independence that happened in 1956. It is the largest public facility and public leisure infrastructure built right after uh, Morocco's uh, independence. And this is extremely important. Uh, because in the um, it played a very big role in the creation of national identity when the new kingdom of Morocco emerged after Morocco's independence. And this big project was an opportunity for the newly independent Morocco to project an image of being progressive. And this uh, project, the thermal bath, came in a wave or in trend in Morocco in the late 50s and, and, and 60s to develop economic uh, growth in the country through uh, tourism. And this was um, supported by international agencies and grants like the World Bank. And, and Morocco really experienced in the 60s and 70s this boom of incredible modern of architecture of, of tourism and of leisure that was really attempting to encapsulate a new identity, modern identity from Morocco, but that has roots within the culture and the traditions of Morocco. This is a hotel in the southern Sahara of Morocco, for example. And uh, the decision to invest in uh, Sidi Harazem as a thermal complex, um, as the largest and the first uh, tourist and leisure facility for Moroccans, built by Moroccans, after the end of the French uh, protectorate was an obvious uh, reason because my grandparents and the uh, older generation, their, the, their best place, or let's say their vacation place, the one that was the most prized was Sidi Harrison that you can see here in this old uh, postcard, because for many reasons, it had uh, this beautiful oasis. It was located right outside of the town of Fez, which is considered Morocco holy city. But most importantly, it had this holy spring uh, that emerged right next to the tomb of this holy man, Sufi man and scholar called Sidi Harazem. Uh, at the time, it was, you know, this uh, very informal form of uh, tourism. There was a small village that you can see here, just built with hay. And this is just to give you a localization. This is Fez. Uh, you can see it's actually extremely ambitious. Uh, it's spread over 14 hectares uh, in this very beautiful oasis valley. Uh, it had, as you can see, See here an entrance plaza with the public fountain, uh, a uh, hotel right here, as well as this pool that's quite incredible that was in my first uh, image. And then, uh, you know, kind of this uh, central garden, uh, Riyadh, bangalows that are this modern interpretation of Medina's. 
and then a uh, market. It actually has uh, two markets. And so what got me actually interested in this heritage, I mean, as I grew up in Fez uh, of, of nearby, and even when I became an architecture student, I had no idea who was the architect. So scholarship on modernism after the independence is completely unknown in Morocco. It's a field that really just um, starting. So, you know, like as a young architecture student, I had no idea, I knew this was exceptional architecture, but I didn't know who was the building, when was it built, and why the reason why it was really exceptional and i have really to thank for that my grandmother my late grandmother saida that you can see here because she was a strong believer in the healing power of the spring of City housing, like many Moroccans all the way until today, believe that uh, the, the water, which is a hot spring, would relieve uh, rheumatisms, etc. And so, with my grandmother, as I grew up on Fez, I spent with her some stays in the hotel and in the bungalows in the magnificent garden. So, the water from the spring was carried just through gravity across this series of, of gardens and basins. The architecture was truly embedded within the rocky landscape, and really, this integration of water, landscape, and brutalist uh, language it was really exceptional and remains today really exceptional. This is uh, the pool. Uh, I am sorry, maybe you should go a bit slower because they are translating you into Turkish. Oh, I am maybe so not, sorry. Don't go so fast. Thank you. I am so sorry. I will try to go uh, yeah. slower. And so this is this uh, the main pool, which is fed by the hot spring. And so, you know, at the end of each day, the water would be uh, released and a little laguna would form around this uh, swimming pool. This circular cantilever that you can see here, it creates shade and it's a canopy and it's uh, 25 meters in diameter. It's a very exceptional concrete uh, structure. Another image, this is a postcard uh, from the uh, 70s showing the bottom of the pool. Uh, and you see its relationship to the rocky landscape. And on the right-hand side, you have the hotel. Uh, the hotel also has this uh, very Corbusian architecture since it is lifted on this V-shaped uh, pilotis. And the reason why it is lifted is to allow for the water starting from the main plaza to slowly go down the entire slope of, of the site. And fortunately, uh, as I was growing up in Fez, I mean, fortunately, the building was pretty untouched. But as I started my graduate studies in architecture, this is what I witnessed. And this was, you know, the concrete was covered with this green Moroccan tile. And this is, you know, this Moroccanization of this architecture. And this really comes from the fact that this architecture, which is exceptional on international standards, but was not understood by Moroccan authorities because this concept was built by the Moroccan state and is still owned until today by the Moroccan state. So as I witnessed this happening as an architecture student, this is what led me to research who was the architect, why was this architecture so touching to, to me and was it truly exceptional and I believed so. And this is where I actually had to take the role of an activist since this architecture was being desecrated. A lot of public funds were spent to turn the building from this to this and this is you know like a complex. Fortunately only a small part was changed, was altered and uh, even though I was a student, I actually wrote in newspapers. That's what actually drove me to create Dokomomo Morocco, is when I witnessed these uh, changes. Mm -hmm. And this is part of our heritage. And it was denied by the Moroccan authorities because it was not understood, because it was not studied. And whereas it could, you know, if it remains, it tells part of our story as a young state, but it also could be a great economic lever for uh, tourism. And by some luck, I mean, when as a student, my letters didn't do anything, uh, the, the complex actually closed down in its vast majority, aside from the main plaza. And I heard of this grant called the Getty Foundation, Keeping It Modern Grant, and uh, to apply for it, to lead the, the, the whole study for the conservation management plan, I had to convince the government of Morocco to accept this grant and to apply with me. That took some effort and some 
lobbying on my end, but I succeeded in 2017, by the end of 2017. And this is where we got uh, awarded the Keeping It Modern grant that allow us to go through these four steps, because this is a question that you might you know, ask yourself, how do we conserve such a heritage? A heritage that doesn't have a clear written history uh, or doesn't where the architect died. Um, and so there are four um, phases of this um, process that the Getty Foundation funded with the data collection raising a public you know, um, uh, awareness, but also the awareness of the government itself to lead a diagnosis, to know what are the, the, the problems and how are we to fix them, and then to give the actual solutions and the policies for conservation. And, and this was the first time in Morocco that such a process was led uh, for a modern uh, complex. And so I'm going to show you just very quickly what it uh, entails to gather this data on, on a building that had none to, to, to start with. So the first thing is to understand the context where this uh, project uh, emerged. And it was, the, you know, at a moment right after Morocco's independence, where Michel Ecochard, this very famous uh, urbanist, started a new approach uh, to, for architecture built for Moroccans, the colonized. And so he looked at traditional forms of architecture and proposed new housing uh, with a courtyard. For example, this is you know, a project in Casablanca where each apartment has an elevated um, courtyard. And this legacy of Ecochard after the independence of Morocco um, continued. And this is one of the housing projects of Jean-François Zivaco in the Saharan town of Warzazat, for example. And a lot of, um, you know, like uh, I would say uh, sensibility to the climate, like you can see here, the famous Nida Bay building, the Honeycomb building in uh, by Atbat uh, Afrique by Candelis, uh, Josiac and Wood. And you can see here their analysis of, of the sun. And another major event that really marked the, the birth of this modernism in Morocco, post-colonial modernism, was an earthquake that happened in 1960 in the south of Morocco, in the city of Agadir, which was the most deadly earthquake in the history of Morocco that killed two thirds of the population of this town and demolished all of the town. And this is where a lot of young Moroccan architects came together and developed this new language with concrete and white plains. And Sidi Harzam emerged at that moment, really, of rebuilding of, of Agadir. The post office in Agadir that you can see here, uh, done by Zevaco, is still pretty untouched today. It's a truly, it's a, mas a masterpiece of uh, brutalism. But uh, of understanding, really, this context of Sidi Harzam, where, how it emerged, what uh, Zevaco was building made us really understand uh, the approach also to take for its conservation. For example, here, this is the post office of Zevaco. You see he detailed every single thing from the furniture to the light fixtures. And I wanted to share with you also the, the hotels that emerged at that moment that were really trying to express modernism mixed with uh, locality. And to come back to um, Sidi Harazam, um, um, Zivaco really was given this blank, blank slate with, you know, like a village, you know, like obviously we're going to see what he was going to do with this village. So uh, understanding then the architect is really was also um, necessary. An architect that left absolutely no writing about his work, very introverted. Uh, 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 person, I could only find a correspondence, and it was all spread around the uh, world. Uh, some in Canada, where some of his uh, workers and students had moved in France and also in Morocco. The archive of the clients were flooded, and unfortunately, all the information of Sidi Harrison was lost. And so so research is essential to be able to preserve something correctly. You know, the proper team need to be assembled, but also proper research. This is, you know, some of the early buildings of the, the first building of Zevaco Villa. That's a cafe now in Casablanca. Uh, this is some of his first building, like this uh, airport has very Art Deco vibes to it. And certain motifs that are st started to appear as I studied the architecture, like very sculptural columns, like very sculptural uh, stairs, uh, suspended stairs, uh, pilotes as well, building lifted on, on pilotes. And that started to give me, me and my team clues on what are the essential elements to protect in Sidi Harazan. I wanted to share with you the house of Zivaco very quickly because uh, there are some saying that says that the, the house of an architect reveals his soul. 
And so the, the house of Zevaco was built around the central courtyard. It had his own, his office, architecture office in it, and his home as well. And this is the fence. The fence is this uh, metallic, uh, let's say, uh, spines, um, you know, thorns also that look like almost like landscape. And the courtyard and water are themes that we're going to find again and again and again in his work. You see there's a stream that goes through his living room and a courtyard that then can open and close. One last thing is the influences of Zivaco uh, by uh, Brazilian mo modernism. And this is an entry on the right of Oscar Niemeyer for a museum in Venezuela that was never built. And on the left is a pavilion for uh, the Casablanca uh, International Fair that Zivaco built in 1960. Um, and um, just very quickly understanding what was on the site was also uh, essential. Like I told you, there was a village, there were some pools uh, as well. We found some very old plans and what we realized is that Zivaco in a very modernist way erased you know, everything. And this population was in moved five kilometers away and that created a very big social divide this population felt that land was stolen from it their livelihood was stolen from it they had agriculture and so doing some almost sociological and anthropological work was very important because this is the population that was working in the thermal station that started to close down so not only were they taking their land and moved five kilometers away but their source of livelihood was taken you know like away from them and this lady that you can see here zahra who was you know like a young girl when she moved um you know came back to the thermal station once and said that uh you know, verbatim, she said, uh, th th this new complex was too modern. It was built for them, not um, for us. Um, and to come back then to the master plan of um, Zevaco, we found uh, a series of drawings that, that showed us his intention, and we realized that he intended other things than what was built. So you can see in blue the extent of the water system. So the, in green is the oasis, and then with the saints, a sanctuary. And he moved this complex to leave some type of, I would say, respectful um, distance from the um, original oasis and saint, and built his complex, you know, like at the south. And you can see here the pool that I showed you in the image, how at the end of each day, water from the spring would be uh, released from it and form this artificial Laguna. And one aspect regarding this exceptional form of modernism, very unique to Morocco, was the reference that Zevaco had with traditional architecture in Morocco, mainly the Riyadh. And so he organized most of the programs around this uh, promenade that you can see here in red, uh, around this central space with fountains, with uh, very beautiful um, landscaping that he called the Riyadh, which you can see here and that frames and it, that's being framed by the hotel on one end and the market on the other. Uh, you can see here how he reworked the topography to get water to flow. And one thing that's exceptional about Sidi Harazem, and I remember this when I was young, actually, is that you would hear water running everywhere. Like here in, in the stairs, you can see that the stairs are cut. And then every time that you have water flowing, there is the use of blue zelige, blue mosaic, which is very uh, special in Fez. So one I would say of the main accomplishment that I can say that we're very proud of is that this drawing that you see here did not exist. And this is our big challenge in conservation in the global south and in Morocco also, I'm sure in Turkey, is that sometimes we don't find the complete drawing. So we had pieces, like I told you, that we had to find in different continents and we assembled them. And actually when I, we completed this plan, I was extremely emotional because this is the first time that all of these drawings were built together. You can see in dark orange, the building that Zivaco built and in light orange here, pink, are the ones that he intended in phase two. And one of them, the one here, was a spa. And this spa never got to be built. And unfortunately, this is also what led to the downfall of this thermal complex, that this major piece of infrastructure never got built. It was meant for phase two and didn't have the budget to do it. So, I mean, sorry, this is a little bit fuzzy, but I just wanted to show some of the drawings we found. So we had the real architecture that sometimes what changed and altered, original drawings, photos from the time, 
And those are the type of drawings that we had to do, uh, you know, to um, document the uh, architecture, but also to start its rehabilitation. So th those are the stairs that lead from the main plaza to the pool. You can see that land, you know, these planters, waterfall basins are integrated in it. And this is the pool that I mentioned to you. And one thing that really surprised me when I was um, traveling in the areas around Sidi Harazem is how the, the pool looks like certain traditional forms to catch water in arid climate that you can see here. So what was the most important part of this process for the, to, to, let's say, to build the starting point for conservation that Getty really allowed for? Because in Morocco, very often the government would say, okay, we need to restore something. I mean, sometimes, it's, most often it's not modern heritage. Modern heritage is demolished. But let's say even a building from the 19th century, 18th century, 8th century, um, there is not this luxury to do this research. One would just start rehabilitating without understanding the um, or, uh, original building. And so the, for modern heritage, it was doubly difficult. We had to change this habit, but thanks to Getty, we had the funds to do so, but to change the mentality of the owner of the site, but also of the users, uh, the people that I told you were moved and that now had this informal markets that they, where they sold things to um, tourists that you can see here. They really didn't, they, some of them had never gone inside the hotel and so forth. And for them, it was an ugly concrete set that just had no reason to be kept. And to do that, we used social media that ended up being very effective. We, la we launched a, a campaign on, on Facebook to raise awareness, but also to ask people to share with us uh, their um, um, photos. Uh, because some places, for example, this is the ancestry of the selfie which you can see here and here. So it's through sharing these photos that, that we discovered certain uh, um, parts of the original design. One other thing we did, and this is one of my um, specialties, I developed tools and strategies to engage with the different stakeholders and mainly here, the local population. Um, in way, when I say engage is to make them aware why this place is important, to what are the values that they judge are being important. So this is a card game we developed to, um, for people to share what, the, their, what they value most in this space. Obviously, architecture was not one of them at the beginning. And at the end, after the whole awareness, it became one of them. We also engage uh, children through different games. You can see here uh, treasure hunts. And it also with the schools, so schools started to take children in the part of the bath that was closed down. So we allowed that. So there was this uh, reappropriation of a common heritage. Uh, collage games that you can see here to ask children what are the programs you know kind of that they needed um, general of interviews of the uh, locals that now we're having little stores in two informal markets so this was you know a bit of some uh, sociological work to understand what were they selling uh, what was their problems and in Morocco um, the literacy rate is very low, 50% uh, of the population is uh, illiterate. So we develop a picture gram approach so that people would feel comfortable answering our questions when we ask them, what are the issues that you're facing so that we know better how to design for them a, a new market or, or if we are to transform the existing market, what are we to add in it? What has proven to be very effective, uh, and this is through my experience in the past decade working with different communities, is to use gaming, is to use play, to engage different people together. The local population had no trust in the local government because they felt abandoned. They were their land was taken back in the uh, 60s. Their stores were not um, functioning anymore. And so um, to regain trust, I mean, I think there were two key things. I mean, gaming and so forth and doing this engagement from the beginning, not bringing them a final design, final master plan or this are we going to conserve and then they just have to say I like it or not. This I find is very hypocritical and superficial as a form of engagement. But the role of the architect also is to in a way convince the client that this is very beneficial. That if you conserve something and it's empty or people don't take care of it, especially public buildings, it's useless. 
public money is not used well. So um, anyway, so this has proven to be very um, successful. The local population started to regain trust in the client, uh, which it was you know, uh, the government a pension fund. One other thing that was very successful is to train local young women, mainly we had no boys in this case, to become architectural tour guides. Uh, and now they have becoming almost the ambassadors. So uh, it almost felt that if anyway, something happens to me, at least the next generation would be there to protect this heritage that then has become theirs. Uh, we also engaged young Moroccan artists that had, didn't know about this heritage and they started to develop a body of work. So we had the first artist residency. All this we proposed outside of our regular hat as an architect dealing with conservation. We also had the public uh, exhibition in Rabat in the capital to open the eyes of different decision maker about the importance of the heritage. We showcased the work of the artist uh, with it. And we also asked people to vote on the final master plan that we, we co-developed with the users. So very um, quickly, how did we lead the diagnosis? Uh, we used uh, photos of the construction site when we found them, uh, a photographic um, survey, um, you know, like an analysis on, on the drawing. So what are the different type of damages and changes? And we did this for every building, the 14 hectares, and that led us to the development of the CMP, which is the Conservation Management Plan. This is a roadmap that uh, any entity that wants to conserve you know, an important building or an important modern complex or complex of any age that's heritage should do because in a way it gives you a vision a long-term vision on how to, to do it and which programs that i have to stress very much so if you conserve something and it's not uh, useful it doesn't function so we also worked with the government to rethink the identity of city harazam for it to be only a spa would be only too seasonal. So we thought of having a spa and a, a culinary school and an educational center run architecture to reconnect City Harazam with the Medina of Fez, which is in its entirety a uh, UNESCO World Heritage City uh, and uh, the largest medieval town in the world, actually. And so we had to do a zoning plan uh, and also this of exercise that was very important, which is to state what's the levels of significance inside the complex. So which priority should the government give to rehabilitation? Of course, the zoning was the, the most important thing to protect, you know, kind of the heritage to prevent the landscape from being damaged. And I'm happy to say that this was uh, implemented today. Uh, and for each building, we did the same exercise to show what are the elements of high significance that should not be changed, should be restored. What are the ones that allow for some change and the ones that could be changed uh, potentially? And at the end of three years of working, this master plan uh, finally emerged with buildings to be rehabilitated. And in light green, also what we realized, new buildings had to be also done to be able to sustain the new and the future use of the uh, thermal station. Um, we also had developed a small manual that I'd be happy to share, even if it's in French, about which strategies to restore damage to, to the concrete. And um, this is the first project that we we're going to start right before COVID, when COVID hit, unfortunately, was the restoration of the first plaza, uh, the uh, entrance plaza that now doesn't have a canopy system. So this is a rendering of how it would look like. Uh, the also part of the first phase of the rehabilitation is the construction of a new market to, to house the 170 market uh, dwellers uh, that don't that now are just in shanty towns uh, selling things. This is an image of the new market and obviously a spa, which was an essential program to make the thermal bath uh, re get uh, revived again with one elevated bar and the um, actual rooms for the spa underneath the ground. And finally, you know, like as a summary, what emerged from my experience in City Harazem is, you know, this uh, publication, free publication that's going to be out in a month or two, where uh, the uh, architectural school of Metu is one of the chapters here as well, where I, I uh, reach out to my colleagues that also deal with modern heritage conservation in the global south uh, and to compare experiences, because from what I, my, my experience, 
uh, the, the the context in the West is so different from uh, ours. We, we we're lacking expertise. We have little funds. Uh, we have to deal with uh, informality, lack of archives. So we have. Uh, let's say that common to all of our countries is a, a methodology that's very specific. So hopefully this publication would help spread. Uh, some of the knowledge that we gathered and shared. And uh, you can ask me what's next. Well, again, my hat as an activist uh, remains. Uh, since the rehabilitation is on hold because of COVID and funds that were diverted to health by the government, I'm not losing hope that we'll continue because we built a consensus among the local population. We built consensus with the government that now understands the importance of this site, economic and also historic importance and uh, we this I asked the government to allow me to use the space to launch uh, in another more important artist uh, residency where we're going to use a cultural event to activate the site and to be very honest with you the reason for this is also so that to put to, um, interest so that the government doesn't lose interest and 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 this city harrison remains uh, in the news and would keep its rehabilitation as a top uh, priority and then to end to tell you that uh, we shared uh, a lot of our finding on this website uh, it's in english and arabic cityharrisonstation.com uh, i would invite you to go to it it has interviews of stakeholders uh, of images drawings and our master plan Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Azize. It was great to uh, listen to you. And while we didn't know about so many brutalist buildings in Morocco either, it's, uh, I'm really very positively surprised about the ones in Agadir mostly. Yes. As well. Um, uh, you talked to us about your experience uh, um, in terms of including the uh, stakeholders, the local people, etc., in the decision-making process. Uh, how did the uh, local administration, the municipality, and the central administration, the state, uh, reacted to this uh, sort of um, participatory process? Did they accept it? I <laughs> Could have you give uh, more detail? <laughs> I have to be very honest, at the beginning, they didn't uh, accept it because it's not something usual. And because there is this belief that I'm the expert, so then I should know and I should just be in my office with my pen and making uh, studies and a master plan and presenting it to them. And this is what should be uh, applied, right? Uh, my approach was different. I mean, having also the funds from Getty was helpful because I could say this is an approach that Getty is supporting. But I have to say that I did it in a very also, um, let's say, um, pedagogical manner because I understood that uh, if a process is not common, people are scared or are worried that it's not going to work, that it's going to cause uh, unrest, etc. But I think as I explained the, the benefits and also the political uh, benefits, because then uh, the population feels involved, feels that it has a voice. And also for the project, there are certain things that the population has been living there for 50 years or six years, no better than me. Uh, I discovered so many things. There are also certain needs that were very important. Something as silly as they, you know, they asked me, they said, well, the, the we're, we have many people coming and, and drinking water and they're being sick. So we need a small place with a nurse uh, so that, you know, we can actually handle, because otherwise we have to call an ambulance and we take them to Fez. So um, I think that the knowledge that the users have is so important and can save time, it can save money. And also when the project is finished, especially when it's a public project, the population is going to take care of it, feels that it's theirs and it's not going to trash it or like not use it, etc. So uh, again, it was um, met, my approach was met with a lot of negativity and fear that it's going to be a waste of time, waste of money, make the process longer. But at the end of it, they, they've acknowledged, I mean, not to be forceful at the beginning and explain the benefit, but the positive thing is that at the end, they were thank you. Now this is an approach that we're going to take, we want to take on for other projects. Well, with the end result will be very good, I hope. Uh, what you have done is a very innovative process. It's not a usual process, obviously. And um, what do you think about the reception of the building? Uh, 
the, one of the main problems is uh, ex not uh, the public does not accept these uh, type of uh, buildings as heritage normally. Yes, yes. So, uh, uh, I was also very uh, surprised by this, as I thought that the process is going to be very difficult. But, but actually, um, even I mean, I told you, fifty percent of the population I had to deal with was illiterate, might not have gone to school. But the language of beauty and poetry, it's something that's unequaled, right? And it's really universal. So uh, taking people on tours, explaining to them the vision of the architect, you know, that they, they needed to see sometimes beyond what the place has become, uh, either abandoned or, uh, you know, not in very good shape, or the concrete is ugly, they think it's ugly. But when they start to see that there are so many different textures of concrete, that this column is sculpted, to, to discuss shadows, to discuss materiality, to touch all of the materials. When you engage on this level of the five senses, um, I found that the beauty emerged. People are sensitive to, to the beauty as, as, as soon as you explain it and explain its purpose. I'm so happy it works. It's usually a very hard process because people usually not do not tend to see the beauty in these buildings when they're old and sort of dilapidated and not looked after. I'm so happy it worked uh, so far. And I think um, social media really helped too, you know, uh, looking, you know, uh, showing uh, uh, images for the past. And in their sense of pride also to say, look, this actually was very unique. And also seeing them seeing that they are, uh, you know, that we organized actually an uh, e-commerce event there, uh, a Getty workshop there. So for the local population to see uh, international of interest, the fact that we interviewed them, that their stories in this space mm -hmm. was important to empower them also in the future of the space, all of those things, you know, the involvement of the youth, uh, the workshop with the children, they're going to go speak to their parents, you know, so in a way I tried in this project, I took all the tools and experience I developed in other projects around the world and applied them here. And I think it's all of them working uh, together. Uh, and it, it's, it's true that this might be a luxury sometimes because we want to work very fast, but if this is embedded from the very beginning, uh, I, I mean, I saw, I mean, this is, I mean, for me now, even if the building, the government doesn't decide to pour money into its rehabilitation, I see a very big victory because the local population is convinced that this is their heritage and this is an important heritage. That's great. I mean, authorities usually expect very, very quick results. That's a general problem with restoration. Unfortunately, it's hard to convince them. Yeah. Uh, something else we will discuss today in the rest of the panel is the um, uh, integrated work, like how could we, uh, how could NGOs like Docomomo work with uh, municipalities, local authorities uh, and uh, local people and so on. So would you like to add something about your experience because you yes. get the Docomomo and the local authorities and the local people, you have already done this at a very sort of uh, in a very large circle. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, my advice, what I can tell you from my, uh, you know, experience in Morocco and now I'm working in Senegal, uh, you know, is that as soon, I, I can understand that the local authorities have, you know, obviously political agenda, a certain number of years, they want to do things quickly, but also the economics is important. And, and the moment that shifted the, the Moroccan uh, state, uh, the owner of the land, was an invitation by Getty for us to attend a workshop in London. And when we visited together the Barbican complex, which is this brutalist complex that was turned into a money-making powerhouse. You know, now it's one of the most desirable places to live. It has a cultural facilities. And I think the, when I would say the, the, the Moroccan government understood that this heritage can bring economic development, can bring tourists, tourists of a different kind, that this is an asset, that uh, I think this is when the mentality uh, changed. And I think uh, as an NGO, Docomomo and all of you have a very big role to play because a lot of the heritage would disappear if we don't wear the hat of an activist. Like I told you before, if I hadn't, uh, you know, in a way, uh, done all of the discussion, wrote articles in the common, uh, I would say, regular general public newspaper, specialized paper. If I didn't go meet different government of 
entities within apply for the Gateway grant. The complex was about to be sold to a Chinese company that was going to demolish it and build a golf course. So, uh, it's, it's, you know, like uh, uh, sometimes it's just because people, uh, decision makers do not have the information that this is an exceptional building. This can add to the history of Turkey. This can bring new tourists, new forms of tourism. So the role of Dokomomo, among others, is to raise this awareness by any means. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of more minutes, maybe. Would you like to show the video, Aziza? Uh, yes, if you can just give me... Uh, yeah, yeah. Like and since we haven't received really any questions from the uh, audience, uh, if the panelists here would like to ask something while we are watching the video, we can add a few more questions maybe. Uh, we can take one or two more questions if you want. Sure. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the, the video. Um, I think this is not it, sorry. Sorry, just let me... Um, yeah, so um, any other question? Yeah, uh, one of my friends is uh, messaging me. She's asking about the memory value for the uh, local people. Oh, um, like, sorry. Yes, uh, sorry, you know, so what was the question? Uh, whether uh, the memory value sort of uh, did, did this building affect the lives of the people positively? So is there sort of collective memory? Um, but what did what do the local people that live around here, do, did they hate it because they were removed from the area? How did you change sort of this? Yeah. It's an, uh, you know, like it's an interesting question because you have one generation that did feel like Zahra, that uh, the, the project was not for them, and others that found economic activity working mm. there. Some that were very proud that this was the most attractive tourist complex in Morocco. Uh, many people, actually, one of the interview, the one, uh, I, you know, I had at this uh, interview was for people that used to spend their honeymoon in Sidi Harazem. It was a very attractive space for a, a, a funny morning. And so, um, you know, like I would say that it's by sharing a vision of what it can become in the future, and that's something that people decide have a say on, it, it is what changed their perception. They thought it was not built for them, and suddenly now we're offering them certain programs that they need. So this is, in a sense, the whole participatory approach changed the uh, perception. So hopefully the next generation uh, will think that this is their heritage and preserve it. Uh, and they will be also um, benefiting from it uh, in terms of their life and sort of sustainable cultural tourism, whatever. So they will be benefiting from the presence of this heritage, hopefully. I'm, I'm hoping so. That's my dream. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah, exactly. <laughs> it's a very beautiful building, yes. Thank you. Please come. Uh, you're all invited to come to Morocco uh, and to visit it. The hotel is open. Um, there's no one in the hotel, so <laughs> we can organize a Dokomomo Middle East meeting here, uh, hopefully. I mean, I'd be more than happy to uh, tour you. Uh, the, that will the be very good. Very great. I could not join the Comos 20th century uh, meeting there, unfortunately. I couldn't come, but maybe we can do a Docomomo Mediterranean meeting or something. It's an excellent idea. Anyways, you're all uh, invited and I'll be more than happy to help you organize it. Thank you. Thank you. There are no more questions. So if you stay with us, uh, maybe if there is time and questions at the end of the session, uh, then we will ask you again uh, if you can stay with us. Otherwise, uh, I'm passing on to Yildiz Salman for the next uh, part of the panel meeting. I think there is just a question arrived uh, from chat. Um, yeah, should I read that? <laughs> Please. Yeah. Um, is there any sort of uh, formal education uh, in the schools in uh, Morocco about heritage uh, awareness, heritage preservation? 
Um, is it included in the sort of teaching program somehow at any level? That's the question. No. <laughs> no. Okay. No, it, it's not uh, included, you know, like unfortunately. And and so we did a few workshops, you know, like in the different schools, private and um, state schools. And there is a beginning of an interest. I mean, students, uh, you know, are interested in Zahadid's uh, projects, you know, not in this type of modern project. So there is a change in perception that one needs to give them to show them the wealth of, I mean, the structural wonders that you find in these buildings, materials, innovations, passive systems. When you get them uh, interested, I think the eyes are started to be open. And there is a young Moroccan NGO called Mama Group that I recommend that you look at, that looks at modern heritage in Morocco. Uh, and so I think it's there's no formal education, but the young architects are, this is really starting. It's really the beginning. Okay. Uh, thank you. I hope it's the beginning. Well, and it could begin for here as well. So maybe we should have a Tokomomo Young as well. I agree. It's a very yeah, good idea. Turkey. Okay. Thank you. Uh, back to Yildiz Dan with for the rest of the panel meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much to Aziza. This was a great intro and. I would also like to thank Marmara Metropolitan Union uh, both for this event and uh, calling us to uh, this event and also we were able to make uh, some workshops and <clears throat> after Aziz's speech from Keynote the section that we are going to be presenting to you is also about these uh, workshops so we are also going to be informing you about these workshops for the session and if you will allow me I would like to also for uh, my organization I am going to have a small presentation about our point of view and of course the main theme of Maruf this year is reimagining and moving together so uh, for my FS Dokomo to Turkey and for the modern uh, architectural uh, culture is under risk and what we are trying to take attention to here is uh, for our uh, viewers who might not be familiar with this uh, thing, the organization, I would like to talk about Tokomomo uh, organization. It is an international uh, organization and and Tokomomo Turkey is among them and they have been founded in 2002 and they have been included in uh, the international organization. Now the international global organization's uh, purposes include that you can see the purposes in the screen of course but there are documentation and the inventory of that and also other uh, information generation about application of these uh, are included but uh, there is one goal that we have you can see uh, Miss Aziz also talked about the protection of the modern architecture and we are uh, hoping to gather attention and information about this problem and Dokomomo Turkey is also working on this purpose and we are having a series of events uh, focusing on that problem and in a lot of different uh, provinces in Turkey we are working on uh, uh, this problem. I think in Hoster event was uh, one of the most important one and they have been a having these uh, events since 2004 every year of course last year because of the pandemic we have to have it uh, in an online manner and this year we'll also have it in an online manner but to be honest we are achieving a lot in this uh, manner we are creating awareness in academy as well a lot of academicians uh, are working on this and also a lot of uh, other decision makers are also being informed on this 
uh, manner. Of course, decision makers usually, yes, they might have some awareness beforehand, but for the future of these structures, how to plan the futures, we may not agree all the time. So that's why as Dokomomo Turkey, both for public, both for our colleagues, also for these areas, we have to inform each other and we have to some have some campaigns and events for uh, these uh, works and we are constantly sharing our view with the public now today in this panel as i said we have a lot of uh, participants coming from a lot of different municipalities all around turkey but what is the 20th century's legacy what are we talking about the modern architecture legacy and i would like to talk about this point a little bit because this question is not a question that has the definition in our uh, guard and protection legislature of course we have to talk about this subject in a legal manner as well ecomos turkey uh, that has been done in 2030, the text that has been sh shared in that event has some international and national uh, applications and they were de de defining a very wide definition and for this uh, category for legacy and a lot of provinces that were included in this they were so that we can protect uh, and convert, conserve these values that we have. We are also working with uh, people one on one and we realize there are a lot of different values that are coming and academically, usually in 20th century. We have some uh, social values, technological values or aesthetic values or being a reference is a value and these are important and these uh, structures has to be protected as I said before there are very uh, basic requirements these are very old buildings but they are not uh, counted as historical they are part of uh, the city's history and they have a place in the common understanding of the city and we might have problems about the technology because they are they have been built by another era's technology and of course the loss of functionality or making it harder to be functional especially from some buildings and structures might be focused on the, such a such an old era's uh, challenges and these are our challenges that uh, we have to face but these aren't have to be uh, problems and risks when we are talking about these uh, structures that have mostly been built between 50s and 80s we have to accept that uh, they are under risk and as we have been talking about uh, this subject is since yesterday we talked about healthy city sustainable city inclusive city we have a lot of definitions but if we keep our legacies and protect our legacies of culture in our cities and we move to keep these legacies protected in the future and this is only achievable then if a city has lost has lost its history it will not be sustainable we can go uh, a lot more into detail in this manner and the history of the structures the societal history we have to have 20th century in our past as well and i we know that marmara has the risk of earthquake of course, especially when we talk about the 20th century legacy, the earthquake is a problem and 
we have to be ready for that and we have to make it maybe we realize that earthquake is used as an excuse for other purposes instead of protecting these uh, structures that's why we have to uh, have uh, i have to reference uh, another event that has made by uh, doko momo so repair reuse and recycle is not usually used for the structures but we have to use it again we have to have a new perspective we shouldn't destroy we should repair them we shouldn't have divided uh, resolutions we have to have inclusive we had a workshop uh, done in uh, provinces of marmara and they are going to join us uh, so I would like to invite you to uh, listen to our panelists in our next session. I would like to give the first. Uh, f I would like to give the floor first to Miss Oljai. No, it wasn't Miss Oljai. I think it was Miss Imran. Okay, yes. Hello. I am representing Shishle municipality first of all I would like to give an evaluation for my uh, area after our uh, last workshop we have taken a look at what we have done before we realized that we don't have the proper inventory and we have to work with uh, planning areas and we have to generate and realize which buildings and which structures need to be focused on of course we don't want to lose these structures to earthquakes and we have about 1100 uh, structures these are usually older uh, structures, but they are usually in the Republican era, and there are a lot of areas that we have not been able to evaluate. Also, there are a lot of civil and public buildings in uh, our province, and back uh, from the Ottoman times, and from the first uh, areas of the Republic, first uh, time eras of the Republic. The educated uh, and the bourgeoisie of that time has created these structures for themselves in the Teshvikia area. <clears throat> for them, at first we have about a protection uh, plan for them. Miss Imran, we cannot hear you properly. Can you come closer to microphone? And is it good right now? We can say it's a bit better, but all right. Thank you. Can I start from the beginning? All right. As I said, we had a conservation plan to back in 2002 but it hasn't been acted upon back after that for the last six months we had uh, we have some workshops that we have been working on unfortunately we have some staff problems There's a common protocol that we are having uh, a workshop with. First, uh, we are going to fly a drone to realize the buildings with this drone. But what is uh, in these rooftops and what is existing on these areas, we are trying to realize these things. And after that, of course, we have other parts an area called uh, a conference area and around the municipality building 
we couldn't have a, a data find the data of, about that subject so we are not trying to, we are trying not to specifically have the building considered on its own we want to consider its medium as well so it's not enough to just focus on the building by itself we have to also uh, evaluate the trees around these structures and we have to realize uh, them as well we have to evaluate all of them and we have to create reports and documentation also we are taking a look at other uh, municipalities examples and we are trying to create a framework for our plan and we are working on our plan right now and after getting the confirmation for everything that is going to be done on this area we are going to create a guide for the citizens so the decision makers will have the data they need to be able to make the decisions at the same time after this uh, evaluation is done we are gonna have the numbers uh, on how many buildings can be improved on how many buildings can be focused on of course between us of course I am not able to hear the speaker properly so that's why a translation is going to have problems for this subject we are gonna have to we are gonna have to take a look at the cultural impact of these structures in the among the populace because at one point if it's unfortunately breaking down by itself it doesn't mean anything at one point if it's very very old and it's not uh, maintained of course those areas are important as well they might have some historical importance as well as or cultural as well but what I have to generally say is uh, that uh, that's all I have to say and with my collaboration with other uh, municipalities and this is not just for the inventory this is we we had some contests about this and I am not able to hear the speaker unfortunately during the transitional period to the Republic there were a lot of uh, structures we have to find these and report these have the documentation for them as I said we don't have a lot of participations I would like to also say I've been working as an architect and before working at municipality what I want to say is in the third area in Istanbul in Çatalca or Avcılar or Küçükçekmece areas there are a lot of great structures and other than that what I want to say is when you take a look at uh, Beylikdüzü for example the 
these areas of Istanbul. I think these areas had a lot of great buildings. I'm sorry, Miss Imran, but we are constantly warned, uh, alerted about the time. There are uh, we are running out of time. If you are able to, we if we can say thank you to you and continue with Miss Sema from Balıkesir. So we can hear their experience as well. Thank you very much for your uh, speech. Hello, everybody. I would also like to remind you that time is quick as possible. We have uh, lost five minutes. All right, I will be keeping as short as possible. You know Balıkesir, of course. Uh, you know about this area. I would also like to remind everybody, in 1941, they have the first uh, plan in Balıkesir, started in 41 and ended in uh, 46. In Balıkesir, this is a great uh, reference because in Turkey, this has been uh, applied in a couple of provinces and they have been investing in this province. Of course, it is close to Istanbul. There are a lot of production in this area as well. Such a city had uh, these plannings uh, in the 40s. Of course, it reaches a high point in the uh, 50s. There are a lot of modern architecture. There are a lot of school buildings from back then. And there are a lot of women's centers, birding centers, birding health areas and there's a new square uh, from and uh, has been built on top of the old square old bazaar which has been burned down unfortunately and it has been uh, maintained uh, and renovated in 2012 of course Uh, we are having uh, legal problems because there is uh, no legal infrastructure to register these buildings as and document them. But even without these uh, documentations and registrations, I listen to Ms. Aziz say, and of course I will also follow it in more detail in the future, they use social media. What can we do for the 20th century's legacy? both for Turkey's provinces. I'm talking about Balkesir specifically, of course, to con conserve these. How can we get these point of views across to the public? From architectures to engineers, a lot of people are uh, thinking that they don't have any specific uh, identity on this. So people are saying that we shouldn't Con conserve these so how can we create awareness for these uh, structures how can we create awareness uh, and the value that uh, they require maybe Dokomomo can lead us into a specific campaign to be able to achieve this we are creating maps and archives and inventories but unfortunately these structures are being destroyed. Of course, in Belkesir they had a Sigorta uh, Bazaar. It was a great legacy, but unfortunately it has been uh, destroyed. Caravan uh, Palace Hotel was a great uh, structure in the square and the center. Uh, and it's also been destroyed. Uh, having them in the inventories is not really enough. Having them standing and uh, I think people need to learn and love to live with these buildings how can we achieve that how can we make people accept it so that these are included in the city's memories and most of us are realizing that but uh, of course there are a lot of economical problems and what people want is instead of having two-story buildings they have to have 10 story buildings and they can create some rents from that, some income, some 
economical value, but these structures, historical structures, can be an economical value on their own. We're also talking with local governors, uh, local governments, and I have a lot of things to say, and I have questions for my superiors. What can we do about this? For example, for Balkistir, what can I do for Imrania, for Shishle, for Tekirda? What can be done? We are not powerful enough for conservative uh, applications. We work at municipalities for the registries uh, and recording and documentations. We can't do anything. For example, for five years ago, Balukesir State Hospital uh, has been admitted for uh, the documentations, but unfortunately, this is not. Uh, accepted and confirmed and the higher-ups uh, prefer to not do that and we cannot go over the politics unfortunately so what can we do about these things and as an activist as uh, Ms. Azize said uh, they can have uh, some suggestions in that area and also um, my uh, colleagues uh, from other cities can have some uh, suggestions yes in both cases these structures in both cases are constantly under risk because they are not registered they are not um, made properly this is because they want to build some new buildings that they can have some economic uh, gain from there are a lot of civil engineering examples in uh, a lot of different areas in uh, around uh, the city as well I can talk about them one by one but this is not going to help. Uh, we have to know how we can protect them. Are we guys? Are we, do we have to uh, focus on the, the registries, registrations? How can we communicate with people? How can we show that this is the city's memories, the 20th centuries and modern architecture? How can we create awareness about the importance of these structures? Thank you very much, Ms. Sema. You have finished with a great example. Now I would like to uh, let uh, Ms. Dilshat from Tekirda speak. This was a great uh, example because uh, Golden Camp is a great example because it was an example of modern architecture in Dokomomo's event and they are also showing the Dokomomo's uh, examples in that and the owners are realizing that maybe this is as important as a legal registration but of course we hope to have a legal registration for protection as well Miss Dilshat what would you like to share with us from Tekirda hello I am Dilshat Ergun I am the uh, I'm working at the municipality for uh, city planning and I'm the director of the department. I'm as the as a metropolitan municipality uh, we hope to protect our legacy and <clears throat> we have some projects on that subject and in general for Tekirda and for the projects of us to be able to have these I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but I would like to quickly go over them. Tekirda throughout the history, <clears throat> this has been a very special area where cultures clashed compared to other uh, provinces uh, in Trace. It is very similar culturally and historically. And uh, Tekirda has about 6,000 years of history and all these civilizations have their imprints on the province and the city and we can see the uh, art uh, on this uh, city and the importance of the uh, legacy we have about 23 cultural uh, structures most of them are civil uh, architecture about 43 of them are official and 30 of them are mosques some of them are uh, fountains 
and civil uh, examples uh, have uh, 600 numbers uh, our purpose is having uh, Tekirdağ and the city and help the identity of uh, the city and uh, creating a brand of the city we are continuing our work for the city but like many cities in turkey tekirdağ is growing fast and by uh two week statistics uh, it is one of the most um migration receiving cities and with this growth we see that it is losing its connection with its past and we are saddened by witnessing that in order to maintain this connection that is con uh, conveying uh, our cultural assets to next generations we created certain projects and we call it a uh, heritage heritage workshop uh, you know heritage is a um, like a magic concept so we should um, just communicate the concept of heritage to the next generations uh, even a an old radio coming from uh, our grandparents for example is a part of this so in the scope of this heritage workshop without looking into um, their um, ownership uh, from fountains to hospitals and from there to industrial complex uh, we have created many uh, projects uh, in, uh, with uh, metropolitan municipality and we restored and renovated 36 uh, structures and doing this restoration we want to give a touch of street to the cities and in regarding the the country areas uh, we wanted to establish a uh, cultural uh, uh cultural uh, attractions so looking into structures uh, of 20th century in Tekirda uh, most of these structures are owned by um, uh, state-owned uh, enterprises they are official buildings uh, an important uh, structure in Tekirda is in Chorlu it is the military hospital and then we have Republican elementary school and uh, the government building in Tekirda in uh, the district of Suleiman uh, Suleiman Pasha the vinery and then the uh, we also have um, the barracks of uh, 57th uh, brigade and these are examples uh, of tw from 20th century to protect this heritage uh, the sens sensitivity of uh, local governments is very important and we can maintain this uh, joint work we can apply the registries together and uh, the original directorate of cultural assets is also supporting us and I'd like to acknowledge their contribution as well and we also have Kudep uh, in uh, the scope of uh, metropolitan municipality uh, with their help we are we're trying to provide technical support and I'd like to talk about two examples of uh, assets from 20th century one of them is the military hospital in Chorlu that is built in 1936 and I'd like to um, appreciate um, the works of Glaucoma national uh, efforts with a manifesto presented to Edirne authorities 
uh, we had the chance to register this building. And I'd like to thank uh, Professor Ilda Salman and Lokomomo uh, Working Group of Turkey. They have given just another asset for us. And then uh, upon the registry, we uh, we approved the renovation, and now it is serving in its uh, initial function. Another structure is uh, the Vinery of Tekirda, Tekel Vinery of Tekirda. In 1939, it was built to uh, make make wines and. You know, Tekirda is famous with its vineyards. In 1967, uh, a, an additional department for a Turkish Raki was added to that. And until it was um, privatized in 2014, it maintained in its activity as a public initiative. So uh, the winery is the first and most important investment made in Tekirda in the Republican period. And uh, the uh, local uh, people have serious connection with this factory because a lot of people earned their living uh, from this factory. It, it is no more active. And uh, in the past, you would have uh, aniseed smellings back in the time. Uh, but uh, this Turkish Raki, Tekirda Raki, is not being manufactured anymore, but it has its uh, it earned its geographic mark, and it's very important for the people of Tekirda, for um, Metropolitan Municipality and Provincial Directorate of Culture. Uh, we registered this building in 2014, and within a 16,000 uh, meter square recreational area, we functioned it to serve as a museum. The project work is moving on as of now. Alongside protecting a neighborhood and a city, even a street, it is very difficult. You know, the mosques and other complex are the biggest um, testimonies uh, in our architecture, but the civilian buildings and uh, commercial buildings are not being uh, that well preserved. But in Tekirda, we are lucky in one sense, most of 20th century buildings are still owned by public uh, companies, uh, and this is why they are being protected. What makes a what differentiates a uh, city? Uh, well, it is important to preserve what differentiates a city in cities that grow and develop fast. The cities are being disconnected from their population, from the human element, because those streets and buildings which are full of memories well they exist no more and then this destroys the feeling of loyalty feeling of belonging among the population thank you very much i'm, I'm wrapping it up with these projects we believe that we opened a window to the past of our city and the light coming from this project would open new horizons. With this, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I salute everyone with respect. 
Thank you very much for your contribution and the messages that you provided. Uh, you know, Chorlo State Hospital uh, uh, by Docomo Turkey, Ecomos Turkey as well. We should keep them in mind as well. And with public authorities, I think we ran the project together in a joint effort and the result was good. We have a presentation uh, from Ushak. Uh, the question basically here says that as the years pass by, we're going to have uh, a lot of buildings and And as the numbers increase, are we going to have problems uh, with the registry? There are certain criteria, of course, but uh, protection preservation experts should be involved in the process. The youngest building uh, that was registered is B B2 house in Ayvacık, Çanakkale. It earned the Ahan Architecture Reward and we all know that evaluating more recent times is more difficult, but we have to get get this done. Uh, as Ms. Dilchat mentioned, you know, our own memories and identity of our city and maintaining uh, the heritage, uh, it is important to create uh, those uh, selection criteria as experts, as decision makers, as every shareholder. So let's move on then. The last municipal participation is from Istanbul uh, Zeytinburnu municipality. We have time restrictions. Now Ms. Oljai is going to take the floor. Hello everyone and good evening. Thank you for the invitation. Of course, Uh, I w I'd like to talk about the uh, the works of art that we have in our um, district. Uh, this is uh, a lock and an unfortunate situation at the same time because looking past Zeytinburnu's history, we don't have many buildings from 20th century. We have uh, the weaving factory and the translation building and they this uh, translation building, for example, Terjuman building, regarding uh, the usage of its material and its static structure, uh, it has been an important building. And looking into the um, a nursery, uh, it is important for women to participate in the production processes. Uh, we have certain identifications uh, from among private ownership as well. I'd like to underline that the um, workers houses in uh, near the factory, for example, uh, they come to the fore. We have similar buildings uh, in Istanbul and they are being transformed in a ruthless manner. Uh, uh, and after that, we have the issue of registry. I'm receiving some messages, by the way, about the registry. We have certain, uh, we need to have certain criteria for that, as it is an important issue. Uh, for that, we need to have the people who actually live in these places uh, on the same at the same table. So, such trans. In such transformations, uh, the inhabitants of inhabitants of those uh, places prefer uh, the most profitable one. So, the urban uh, guides should involve their preferences as well. Uh, right after our uh, gathering, after last week, a young colleague uh, offered uh, a cooperation. On the public side, uh, you know, I, I ran many projects with universities and NGOs and this togetherness that is uh, a, a cooperation between the institutions uh, and participation of NGOs and universities. 
I believe it is a good togetherness in uh, urban sense, uh, you know, uh, creating uh, a guide for the earthquake and having a preservation project together. Uh, they exhibit uh, the most, uh, uh, the richest examples of such cooperation. Why don't we then do the same for preservation of 20th century heritage? Uh, during the pandemic, we uh, translated a, a, a book by uh, a foreigner called Pandemic Kit. We translated that into Turkish and at the international level, NGOs and universities uh, could work together to make a difference and raise awareness. So a workshop attended by Muhtar, that is uh, the uh, district manager, uh, the neighborhood manager, uh, and, and people, uh, the, the living uh, people in this, in this neighborhood, is a good example to that. You know, once we involve the uh, people who actually live there, uh, and once we raise awareness among them, and one, once we uh, take what they want into account, would play an important role in the transformation and preservation of these things. As I said, it could be a lock and uh, unlock at the same time, uh, but I believe it's more of a lock because it's like a gem that needs to be preserved. You know, uh, they could be declared as a protected zone. Uh, because as of now, you you wouldn't like to see what it turns what they turn into, you know they're not getting higher uh, in terms of the stories, and they have add-ons, uh, and it is and they're losing their original characters. So to to wrap wrap it up, you know institutional cooperation should involve the NGOs and the inhabitants of those neighborhood. I believe such a partnership would be very valuable. As I said last week, a student of a PhD student uh, declared that uh, uh, she wanted to cooperate uh, in, an, in a project in Bakırköy. Well, it's not my municipality, but it's still valuable and I noted it down. Uh, for example, I find uh, that the uh, lighting uh, components of uh, a Galata Tower, they exhibit a certain character, they exhibit a certain identity. And, uh, you know, sometimes you see uh, the preservation of certain mosaics and statue, statues uh, within the city. Uh, well, on these issues, people have certain awareness. Uh, they uh, represent a lot of effort put behind. Uh, a, a similar thing is actually uh, uh, is uh, the urban uh, furniture. For all them, we should work together with universities and NGOs on my own behalf and on behalf of my institution. I can say that we are open to such cooperations and uh, We can work uh, in joint uh, with other sh shareholders, including the people living uh, in those neighborhood. As in my in our pandemic kit, I didn't. I'd like to give it as an example, but I didn't take it with me because I didn't think that I was going to share a visual. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Miss Oljai. Thank you for sharing this and uh, underlining the importance of cooperation between the public authorities, universities, NGOs, and the people who are actually living in those neighborhoods. So the municipalities that are represented here uh, and with some other municipalities, we had two uh, previous activities that brought us here today. Now I'd like to share the results of those previous activities and uh, I'd like to give the floor to Hatija Ayakach uh, to uh, expand on that and 
about what we talk wh about these issues and Aziza's speech uh, and then uh, what the panelists could ask Aziza please use the chat box to address your questions I'm gonna try and send the questions to the right people thank you very much dear Yildiz and hello everyone and like to thank the organization for uh, giving us the opportunity uh, to speak here I'm going to be sharing my screen now and upon that as identified by uh, Professor Yildiz I'm going to summarize our workshops Can you see my screen now? On the issues that we have been discussing, participation of local authorities is vital. And uh, to make it into something effective, we organized two workshops. One of them is involved uh, the metropolitan municipality and district municipalities of Istanbul and the other included uh, the other municipalities in uh, the region of Marmara. So uh, with the motto of rethink and act, act together, that is the basic motto of Maruf, we'd like to underline the risk that is threatening the heritage of 20th century. Uh, I. Uh, we started with such a theme, especially with the Cohomos efforts. We we wanted to uh, research into the existing situation about the losses uh, uh, from modern architecture. So. Well, we aimed at understanding the current situation in the whole region of Marmara, but the Kohomos working group in Turkey, uh, uh, well, we wanted to inform them as well. We had based it on uh, raising awareness on cultural uh, heritage and architecture, and we wanted to identify the existing risks. And in this regard, uh, not, uh, with our local shareholders, not the local, not just the local authorities, but preservation institutions and civic initiatives uh, should have been should have been addressed as shareholders. This was the mindset that we had. I, I want to talk about the um, participation profile for both workshops. You see the number of municipalities that attended. Uh, we have thirty nine districts in Istanbul, and we have the metropolitan municipality. Unfortunately, we want to, you know, I don't want to speak as a criticism, but I want to speak as an invitation to future. Well, we didn't have uh, enough participation uh, in districts uh, of modern architecture. Uh, we wanted to have more participation. And you see uh, the participation rates in both workshops and especially with the numbers that we targeted. We organized our workshop uh, with these municipalities and uh, you can see the corporate identities as well. Uh, mun uh, the metropolitan municipality was represented in this as well. And we had uh, representatives from uh, Adalar Beyoğlu, Bahçelerler, Fatih, Malta, Peşişli, Zeytinburnu municipalities. And in Marmara region, we had we received more attendance from the neighboring cities. And with this, we completed both uh, workshops. Going into Maruf, the uh, 20th, 20th century heritage was under risk. That was our mindset. And we wanted to have a thematic uh, presentation and in the second round uh, we evaluated the information that we obtained and we had uh, sub-sessions and we had uh, the uh, outcomes that I am sharing today. You see uh, both uh, presentations now. Uh, 
you can see the links of those workshops and you can see all the watch all the evaluations so in the warm-up tours we asked four questions to participants and we have done this after the thematic presentation of uh, Professor Yildiz and we asked for three um, buildings that is worthy of heritage and when we look into other fields you know I don't want to mention specific names but we had certain identifications many places were uh, worth um, as heritage and many of them uh, have undergone uh, less than healthy interventions <clears throat> when we take a look at the uh, in the sense of marmara you, we realize that they are, we are not focusing on a specific structure but we realize that uh, all these structures are uh, registered now our second question was in within the municipalities borders uh, which three structures do you think are the most important ones for the context of 20th century architectural uh, legacy? We can see the uh, memory problem because when you take a look at this memory question, currently in the local mindset, even if it's getting attention or not, in Istanbul, uh, structures like AKM is taking uh, priority. If you take a look at the Marmara area, it's the same in the same manner as uh, it is in the last case. We can see uh, these uh, structures are prioritized. And uh, in, in our third question, we ask uh, which legacy value these structures are carrying is uh, our question. We asked as uh, it is said in uh, the marmara area the protecting social good and social value is very important and uniqueness is very important so what are the risks for this is the fourth question and we wanted to see the risks for istanbul earthquake is a very important risk also regulations are important if you were to take a look at the marmara area in general the we are not uh, the fact that it is not uh, prioritized and also earthquake uh, concerns are uh, taken as stage if you were to take a look at uh, the next sessions uh, we had three uh, rounds of questions in our municipalities one of them is for uh, specific uh, structures and another one was about planning now this was uh, about realizing the situation on ground <clears throat> also evaluation uh, evaluating the uh, situation and uh, we did these uh, questions for uh, to be able to understand how we can plan and also we wanted to know about their ideas about collaboration between uh, the structures and uh, organizations i would also like to talk about the first uh, round of questions in istanbul workshop i'm going to summarize the outstanding answers you can think about them as suggestions they are saying there there is an inventory but it is not enough and the records are not enough. Uh, again, the uh, unregistered uh, structures are under threat, and also the structures that they uh, that have people living in them are under threat as well. Also, not just the structures, the gardens, the areas, the sidewalks are under risk for functional meaning the areas that have a uh, commercial meaning and value are uh, in private ownership also the fact that these uh, structures are getting very old and some of them are not maintained at all so these are the uh, losses and risks uh, that uh, we have seen in Istanbul and in Marmara workshop we can see that there are a lot of uh, problems for inventory in the second round of questions, 
we realize that inventory is important again and uh, we realize that city councils are having problems working together and one of the first uh, points uh, for these concerts is uh, collaboration now, like, unfortunately we are not collaborating enough and in Marmara area the conservation organizations are not collaborating enough and we realize that civil organizations are having problems in the third round in Istanbul workshop again and these uh, recorded and registered uh, buildings are uh, housing 80,000 people and also there are a lot of people that are living in uh, similar buildings that are not recorded and registered so I think this is going to be a problem so as Tokomomo Turkey we can see the importance of our workshop in these uh, funds fundings you can see uh, making uh, raising awareness is very important and collaboration systems are very important for Marmara workshop as well I would like to summarize and also let Yildiz talk about it as well but what I want to talk about is in the recommendation uh, document that has been done by European Conseil is uh, that as our participants also said they are also uh, talking about uh, uniqueness, wholeness and uh, universal value so that's why with this workshop and all of our projects we have to have, uh, have we have to take a look at these and we have to think about the common risks and we have to have a common solution uh, system and as you can see we have to work and collaborate today and our workshops are showing that we definitely definitely need an inclusive collaborative action plan I can say that this is the most important part and I would like to let Yildiz talk about it a bit more I think there's going to be a lot of questions and in general for the whole of the speech I think you have a lot of things that you have to add I think our audience might have questions as well thank you Hatice you have summarized it uh, very well I just want to say one thing and <clears throat> I stopped a lot of speakers and I would like to ask if they want to add anything what I want to finish with is as the moderator of uh, this session we as we are always saying and stressing <clears throat> everybody who may or may not be able to join these workshops and all the expertise groups all the NGOs and all the volunteers from <clears throat> different areas we are definitely open to working with everybody every one of these peoples we will always call you if we need your expertise as well and we are very happy to hear from you if you reach out to us as well and in light of what we have talked about today as Azize also said experts usually uh, would like to start uh, these kinds of uh, discussions as an activist but without just hanging on on that manner we have to come together and collaborate think together and, and discuss together we have to create the mechanisms to allow us to do this so we have to create collaboration we can have some future plans and action plans so for example all of the, all the municipalities can talk to us about a specific value they are going to choose we can create awareness about this uh, things that you think they are uh, they are under risk and if we call you we can continue with other subjects as well and Aziza also has listened to all the speeches and I know about Toronto and Ontario uh, subject as well and he's uh, she's very helpful and she's also <clears throat> uh, very valuable and I think I want to know about your uh, opinion as well do you think we are uh, showing some hope yes, 
I think as long as we are here and we're vocal, uh, there is hope. And I think I would like now to turn the table to the authorities. You know, I mean, architects cannot do the job, like what was said. You know, like the decision maker have to be convinced and have to work hand in hand with the expert. And at the end of the day, they're the one that have the money. They're the one that the funds. They're the one that have the decision, and they have a big responsibility. If this, it's also a responsibility as architects. If this heritage is demolished uh, by the decision maker for us to denounce it, right? So we're also there to be the eyes. It's part of our heritage. Our grandchildren would regret it. I mean, would, uh, and, and I think, I mean, why not have the same standards as Western standards? I mean, we deserve to keep even this modern heritage. But I, again, I'm turning the tables to the decision makers, they have the opportunity to save this heritage. We're all here in Turkey as amazing uh, architects, conservation activists. I mean, the Komomo Turkey is doing amazing work. Uh, both ETU and METU and other universities have been doing incredible work in conservation of modern heritage. I think collaboration, yes, funding from the government, from decision makers need to come. It cannot happen alone with just the architects or the Komomo civil society. Uh, as effort. Çok teşekkürler e, Aziza. Evet, e, chatte Sema Hanım'ın bir sorusu var. Aslında e, Sema Hanım konuşması sıra. Thank you very much, uh, Aziza. And Sema has a question as well. As Aziza also said, this is uh, very important. We have to convince the decision makers. This is not just about the value, economical value of these uh, structures. This is also the relationship with the city of these uh, structures. We have to be convincing. Of course, it's not just about uh, money and costs uh, when we are uh, saddened when that is the point. But uh, we also have to so show that they also have value in that manner as well. Now, is there anybody who would like to answer as architectures? about the convincing process of uh, the decision makers what can we do if you have any experience you can share them or you can sh answer yourselves as well we need definitely we need reproductive and creative solutions anybody I can share an experience if you would like uh, Miss Yildiz of course when we take a look at the cities these are not just about the parcels or uh, areas and lands these cities are uh, filled with stories on top of these uh, structures and these life stories are very very valuable we are always uh, working on vocal uh, history for example and Currently, if you have uh, some studies about vocal history, everybody who, are, who you're going to talk to has to be at least uh, 1940s, uh, has to be born in 1940s. So we are meeting with neighborhoods and talking with uh, these people and we realize that they have ownership and belonging to these uh, bu buildings and uh, we have uh, when you create uh, this uh, structure and art again their memories are uh, again recreated and they uh, return back to their youth and you don't have to go to the generations back you can just uh, you can just talk to uh, your grandmothers and uh, similar people you can learn about the history of these structures and you can realize the importance of these structures. I think these are still very valuable. Thank you, Ms. Dilshad. I think Oljay also wants to uh, say something. I think I also have a small another question. We have uh, great questions from our listeners. I am also uh, I also want to talk, thank our audience as well. The question is about the cultural heritage in Istanbul or uh, area, how can we 
e, connect uh, the Istanbul uh, cultural heritage to the cultural roots that uh, that have been made I think this is easily can be made because if we, if we were to work on this uh, cultural roots uh, from 20th uh, century I think we had some uh, workshops with uh, children about this I think if you want to answer that I think uh, you can uh, answer it Miss Oljay go ahead you can answer any question I mean about convincing the decision makers the limits are very important time and budget I have also done a conservation project of course the ownership was public so ownership is very important of course about that uh, having the ownership uh, publicly is very important uh, it is easier if it's the case and we have uh, done a project like that about the other question I think it's about cultural roots I mean in Denizli and uh, other areas we have the roots in Galata for example there is a cultural uh, root road uh, for this there are a lot of exhibitions and events that we that were created to, to uh, get awareness and uh, similar things for example the uh, apartments in Kadıköy uh, as, as well can be included in this I think this will be helpful our crash was in uh, on uh, our culture route so we had uh, dyed the bridge in front of it to the red to create some awareness this was so easy because we just used a bucket of uh, paint and I think using that uh, kindergarten is uh, very important and I think we are going to restore that kindergarten and that route will be again functional and uh, it will be an attraction for people especially in Shishli in Beyoğlu there are apartment uh, pictures and uh, paintings I think for the 20th century uh, the artists from 20th century has created these arts on these structures he's an art historian uh, there's an art historian in Ankara and they are he's saying that we had a uh, project called uh, cultural ants and uh, for example there's a bird uh, statue from a specific artist and they were talking about it and raising awareness on that we can uh, enrich these and uh, I am also saying that the public uh, organizations are always open to collaboration yes thank you very much Brooke is also my uh, student we are at the end of our uh, time this was uh, very enjoyable and we could continue this much more I think while closing I would like to thank Marmara uh, Municipality Union to allow us to create awareness for these problems and also the workshop and the panel who has joined us I am showing my gratitude I am very thankful to Azize for sharing her experiences with us it was very inspiring and also for Docomo Turkey team I would like to also thank them a lot people who are uh, visually here and people who are working at the background and of course at uh, last I would like to thank our audience goodbye